about a year ago, this tool went in to cut this part, but it failed. It chipped out, and that chip caused this spark, which then ignited the oil mist inside the machine. Turns out that our machinists were running an experiment to see how long that tool would last. Well, we learned that time that it would last 68 cuts, the hard way, I might say. It took us about a day to get the machine back together and running again. And 49 minutes later, I heard the fire alarm go off in the plant again. And just like this guy who played the uh, fiddle while Rome was burning, uh, we learned that as we were trying to figure out what went on with machine GN4, uh, the machine has failed to mention that they were running the same exact experiment on GN5, and GN5 started on fire. We had two fires in two days, only the fifth and sixth in the history of the company. The president of the company pulled me aside and said, Dan, this Cotta thing is awesome. Love it. It's doing a lot of great stuff for us, but you can't burn the building down. So that made us look pretty close at what we were doing. Uh, it was a pivotal moment on our journey uh, through Cotta. And so this chart, when, when Chris and I started the Cotta, it was about early 2015. Now, when I say started, it was plant-wide, I'm saying. We were focusing on a few dozen parts of the 1,000 or so that we ship every year, and two customers of the 50 that we have, trying to figure out how do we uh, improve the delivery of those. And when the fire started about 18 months later, it made us pause and say, man, what are we doing here? Well, we realized, if you look at it, where's the, the, the improvement was pretty stark with the delivery. But our quality manager said, Dan, that's not the story. The story is the reduction in variation. Now, he's the closest thing we have to a Deming disciple, and he said, what you have here really is you fundamentally change the process throughout the plant on all the delivery of everything that we're doing, not just those few parts that you guys were targeting. That was a learning moment for Chris and I because that isn't really what we were intending. We thought of it on a much smaller scale, on the scale of a few parts to a few customers. Earlier, we had looked at, well, how do we propagate kata? And, and we thought, well, it seems logical to us that we use the kata to propagate the kata. And we aim for the hearts of the people. What we didn't expect out of any of that was a fundamental process change. That's our story today. The story is the transformation, where we came from to when we learned kata, and then what happened after the fire. So hang on for the ride. Here we go. We, this is Micron. We're a family-owned manufacturer. Uh, been since 1952, the same ownership. We have 43 people. And most everybody is involved in one way or shape or form with the Kata. We are a precision machine products company. We take 12-foot long bars that are 2-inch in diameter or less, and we machine them into parts that go into stuff. I need to go back in time a little bit to set the story up for you so you understand truly the mindset that we were in when we discovered Kata. This is what Micron was in the year 2000. <clears throat> there are people in that picture, by the way. You can see one, but there's others in there. It's kind of like Finding Elmo or Waldo or whoever that was. <laughs> 13 years later, this is what we transformed ourselves into now. Okay, so it's a bright, shiny place. We got some cool equipment, whatever. That's a big deal. That's not really the story. The story is, how did we get there? What's the mindset of the entire company to get us from where we were to what you just saw? We were a very action item driven company. I tell you, when I read the book, when I hit that page where it talked about action item being action item driven, I must have read it eight times. It drove me crazy. I didn't want to admit the fact that that's who we have become as a company. So these, matter of fact, we celebrated it. We have had people from everywhere come and look at our action item towers. That's what these are called right here. So on the right-hand tower, all the colors, by the way, are a different team at Micron, or were at the time. Each brick is an action item that the team committed themselves to. So we would get together, sit down in a room once a week, and we would say, hey, this is the problem. This is how we're going to solve it. And these are the actions we have to take. We've got to do these nine things. A week later, we would come back and say, well, how many of the nine did we get done? We got seven. Okay, so we put nine here, seven there. 
And so we have the plan, success to plan. Now, the amazing thing is, folks, for more than a decade, this is how we measured employee engagement with some used Legos. We were, we were too cheap to even buy new Legos. The used Legos showed to, uh, showed to us that we had a success rate of 85%. 85% of the time a person said that they were going to do something at Micron, they did it. What an amazing thing, right? I mean, you can't buy that. And we weren't just randomly going about changing things. Some folks from Shingo swung by 2008-9 and said we were doing a fairly good job at it and gave us a nice shiny medal. Big deal. Again, they said we were the smallest family-owned manufacturer on the planet at the time to get this over. Again, uh, it's about the mindset that we had. That just solidified, hey, this mindset of I got a... I have a solution, let's go find a problem for it, just made it stronger for us, to be quite honest with you. We have had at least 300 people a year come through the plant to further confirm that, hey, what we're doing is the right thing, right? So it drove it home even farther. And this is uh, our favorite guest, our students, and this is our machinist talking about a day in the life of a machinist that Micron to ninth graders. And then 2013 hit. So this is 2000 to through 2013. A lot of things. It was a seminal year for Micron. Our business had been growing for three solid years, so we were recognized as one of the 50 companies to watch. But all of our numbers had plateaued. From all of our lean efforts, our quality, our on-time, everything had plateaued in 2011 or 12. We were not moving the dial at all. We also, after the, this point, we grew another 37% that one year. We bought a ton of equipment. We went from 30 people, 32 people, to 43 people all in one year. There was chaos. And these numbers that had plateaued were starting to fray around the edges. Our founder passed away that year. And we, we started formal second-generation leadership. More chaos to the, to the mix. By August of 2013, however, I went to the Michigan Lean Consortium annual conference in Traverse City. If you've never been there, it's the best thing in the world. And I heard about this thing called kata. I'd never heard of kata before. Didn't even know what it was. I walked into this room not having an idea of what was going to happen. I walked out of that room thinking, this is the thing that's going to change our company forever. There's no question. I just don't know how to go about it. So I bought the book, and I waited. So here's where I come into the scene here. Um, as Dan said, we were busy. We were very busy. This is early 2014. I had just heard I'd been spent the last 12 or 13 Saturdays there in a row and had just heard that we had a customer that come along and wanted to shovel buckets of money at us by increasing part quantities on a machine that's kept me there every Saturday so far, and I didn't see an end to it. And so I learned that uh, the management team was getting together, so I went right in there and I just kicked the door right in. And uh, I explained to them guys that, look, this is fine right now, but come this summer, I don't intend on spending, spending my Saturdays here. I intend on sharing them with my family. And so we need to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And then I turned around and I uninvited myself mm -hmm. from their meeting. Well, a few moments later, Dan comes out, and he explained to me that I still do have a job, <laughs> which I was pretty happy about. But he started asking me questions, too, about, well, how much does the machine run? And I thought, well, we man it for 20 hours. It's got to run at least 16 of those. And so we started collecting data. What we learned was, on an average, that machine was running 9.6 hours a day. And so that led us to our first experiment, a five-gallon pail, half full of water. That experiment changed my life forever. Because for 30 years, I was taught that you've got to stand at one end of the machine and get the parts as they're coming out, good, bad, and just take care of it that way. What I learned from that experiment was I can come over to the machine and I can control the process that's going on inside of it, and then I can predict what's going to happen on the other end. And I didn't have to stand there at the end of the machine. Changed my life forever. So then, one morning I'm in the shower, 4 a.m. I don't know how many of you have any ideas in the shower at 4 a.m. 
But I had, but I had one, and I went in and I applied it. And about the third iteration of this here experiment, Dan comes rolling by and he stops and he looks, and he looks in the machine and he looks at me. He says, "You do know that that's a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar machine, and you've got duct tape and rubber bands inside of it." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I know, but I had an idea." And he turned and he walked away, shaking his head. I don't even know what he said. Another day that changed the, my, my thoughts forever right there because I learned that I have the freedom to control that process inside of there. And that if I can do that, then I can, again, predict what comes out. And that took the kata process from my head to my heart. And all that I wanted to do at that point was share it with others. So we began to talk about how do we share it with others? That was the thing, and it was an amazing thing. And, I, and I, I, I hate to do this, but when Chris mentioned to me, holy cow, I just learned that what I thought for 30 years wasn't true. He had tears in his eyes. I'm like, holy cow, this was such an impactful moment. How do we bottle this, really? And, and imagine, for a moment, 30 years you're doing something, and you realize one day because of a half-full bucket of water that it wasn't yeah. quite right, yeah. right? So we talked about how do we propagate this everywhere? How do we get more of those changes of heart? I said, I just don't, I don't really know how to do it. And he goes, well, it sounds like an experiment to me. Yeah. That statement yeah. is what put us on this stage today yeah. because it occurred to this, well, well, sure as hell we should use the kata to propagate yeah. the scientific thinking across the whole building, yeah. right? We were targeting the heart's feeling that if we changed the minds, the hearts would follow like they did for Chris. That's mm-hmm. our story. That's what we're searching for. However, go back to the end of 2013. We had a company full of people that were willing to do anything, try anything, charge up the hill, didn't matter, and do it pretty well. But we knew that we had to break the confidence of all of ourselves that that was the right thing to do. Think about it. We had full confidence for 13 years at least that this is the right thing to do. We had to break that. Talk about reverting back to mm-hmm. our old. We mm-hmm. knew that that would happen. If we, so, we talked to our consultant and said, "Hey, we want the training changed. We don't want the standard canned kata training." This consultant had worked with us on and off for 13 years. You know who we are. You have to break this and help us break it. We also began targeting words. Chris used to write down, what are the 10 words or something like that, that if we hear them, we're going to attack? Because we have to eradicate these things out of our lexicon, right? They were just Which a part of what we do. Can't was one of them. Can't was one of them, yeah. yeah Changes exactly. how can we. So we, yeah. we got the president of the yeah. company and two of the newest guys that we had hired, and we, we were on a roll. We took 24 people. We trained them over about a three-month period. We picked the four uh, teams that we were going to have working together on those dozen parts or two for those two customers. We got out of the conference room. That was another thing. We had to break our thought of a meeting takes place sitting down. Heck no, everything is standing up. We went from, I don't know, maybe half a dozen meetings a week sitting down to where we have 16 meetings a day today throughout the plant somewhere, and all but a few of them are standing up. 43 people, 16 meetings a day. We immediately, we met a gal at an MLC event from St. Mary's Hospital, and we did what Michael Lombard said. Yeah. We asked her, because she said she was interested in kata, we said, come on over. Critique us. You do that, we'll help you implement kata at St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Rapids. So Chris used to coach yeah. all of our teams, and then he would get his old flip phone out. It was like a wheel <laughs> chalk, I think. Yeah. He had his old Money wheel. clip. Yeah, yeah, the money clip. Money clip, yeah. And he used to call Sarah every and day. walk through the process yeah. every day. And I second coached both activities. We set ourselves a, a challenge condition to where we wanted to learn it so well in one year that we would be invited by the MLC to, to share sure. our story with other folks. And to do that, we believed that, well, we've got to have six different teams, four at Micron, two at St. Mary's, we wanted to develop six coaches, four at Micron, two at St. Mary's, and we had to have a, a level flow of our kata meetings. Unlike once a week like we were doing, we had to do this every day. As we began to develop coaches, they began to meet with Chris and I every day. 
to go over the process how are we doing in our effort to change the hearts and minds of the people? Now, I'm not going to lie. The thing we haven't figured out to this day yet to do, how to do it, is how do we measure that we've changed the hearts of somebody? You can kind of change, you know, check the minds, but yeah. the hearts. We haven't really figured out how to do it other than instead of listening for words we don't want to hear, we are now listening for words we do want to hear. So I invite you to listen for some of those words. We're giving targets, goals to hold, which we would try to attack all at the same time. Um, so we would do all kinds of experiments. Not, I'm calling them experiments. We didn't know that's what they were, but, but just all over the place. Um, okay, if we just focus on this one issue or this one obstacle, you know, this would obviously fix this, but it will trigger like a chain reaction fixing all of these other issues at the same time. So we focused on scrap. Yeah, as time went by we would we were fixing our scrap and you could visually see that the trend was also fixing the other stuff. So as scrap went down, our on time delivery went, you know, got better and then um our uptime of the machines went up as well. So It'll keep you working in a straight path, single file, I guess you could say, and without going in different tangents. And obviously with the team working together, um, focused, and I think that's the main thing that I've learned or that I saw with Kata. So it helps you stay on track and without spurring different directions. <laughs> <laughs> Andres is yeah. an awesome, awesome dude. I tell you yeah. what, we could talk for 20 minutes on just his yeah. story yeah. alone. But I, I translated what he said into the charts. Um, just, just for your edification, scrap went down from 4.5% to, what is it, half percent, something yeah. like that. Right. The uptime, they, they average maybe 15, 16 hours. On the best of the best days, they can get 20 hours. Now, Chris said we man the plant 20 <laughs> hours a day. That on the best day, they could actually hit that. By the end, the worst day was 20, and they could get 23 hours of uptime, and we're only there 20 of them, right? It was, it was an awesome thing. That translated into we were at 0% on-time delivery at the beginning of the year. By August, they had caught everything back up. We were delivering four times a day to keep the lines going at our customer. August 5th or 6th of 2015, and we haven't missed a shipment on those parts since that day because of what this team has done. Now, these are the charts they, they created. It was awesome. I, I love the visuals. Now, this is the best chart in the history of Mark yeah, got right exactly. here. Exactly. The mistakes on the end there, that there was when I knew that the process had moved from their head to their heart because they tried three times to get that number right for us right. when we were coaching. And this was a group of guys who, in the beginning of the year, told me 16 hours is as best as we can get. And yet our goal was for the machines to run 22, and they said there's no way. And they iterated through experiment after experiment till June. They started setting goals, target conditions of 20 hours plus for themselves, believing that they could hit right. that, removing the I can't, and started saying how can we. When we found exactly. ourselves pulling them back saying, no, you can't yeah. change a target this month to that month so much. It's too much we knew that they were trying to reach yeah. beyond. So we're back to the fire. We have suppression systems on all our equipment. The fires lasted less than two seconds on each machine, but those fires changed the direction of our entire scope. Again, we went through all this. Then we began to think, okay, that's cool. Can we have a fundamental process change on purpose? Can we intentionally do this somewhere else? Back to the same thing here. Now, our concern was, though, we had changed the hearts, but we realized that we, we really hadn't been tracking how well do they know how to do kata. What is their skill level? If we're, if we're setting the machines on fire, we got to do something different. And so that's where we're at. So we began. We took a page out of Andre's playbook, and he said, you know what? Let's look at our overall company customer concern number is what we called it. And forever, it was 1.2%. We set a challenge as a company to cut it in half in one year, and a half in another year, and a half after the third year. We started to create our own system of how do we measure people. 
And our consultant came in and said, what the heck are you doing? Why not use the Dreyfus thing that's in the book? I'm like, oh, well, geez, okay. Kind of embarrassed to admit we didn't read that far in the book, Mike. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> We're, and discovering new things daily. Yeah, so <laughs> we realize we don't have to reinvent this wheel, but what we do have to do, we put micron language to what that says. This is nice, but it's subjective in a lot of ways. We have to put observable behaviors, and that's what our coaches are working on right now. How do we observe the things that are said in here? And so right now, we've got target. We're trying to get everybody in the whole plant to at least a one, the novice level, right? Get a basic level of training to everybody. And then we have different targets at different times for the entire plant. Our theory is that if we can get to a one, we'll have cut that quality number in half. And if we can get to a two, we can do it again. It'll take an average of three to get there. I don't know, I don't know if it's going to work or not. But that's what our theory is. So behind all this, and I know I'm, I'm one minute long here, behind all this, Chris, have an alter Chris and I have an ulterior mm -hmm. motive. Why are we doing this? Well, I mentioned that it's a family-owned business, but I didn't mention that it's my wife's family in that we have a vested interest in this thing, right? And so Chris went from a machinist one day to coaching the president of the company. So it was kind of a big deal. And so there's a lot of personal connection here. The machinist you saw talking to the students is third generation on second shift running a machine. We're coaching him. We're trying to assure the succession. And so the next step in our process is right here. We brought a third generation with us in an effort to try to help assure the succession of Micron. And so our expectation, the reason we invited all you here today is to share your story with my son, Tom, to show him that scientific thinking takes place in every industry, every state, and countries from all over the world. Tomorrow, I'll let you know how that works out and what we learned from it. Just don't burn the place down doing it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>